Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the afternoon, the last afternoon session, uh, using a celery with social networks, uh, presented by David Golden. Uh, David was a member of the Pegasus News team, the first official licensor, licensor of Ellington. That's where he got his uh, his initial Django experience. Uh, since then, he has worked for various Django shops and contributed to uh, uh, to Sprints as well. And now he is helping fix democ democracy, <laughs> democracy as we know it, for uh, uh, Vodison in uh, San Francisco. Please welcome David. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Well, as he said, I work for uh, Vodison. We do a lot of uh, connectivity with social networks. We use um, uh, distributed concurrent systems for this. And so uh, this talk is all about hard-won uh, lessons through my pain. So, Hopefully, uh, I will help you avoid these same mistakes that I've made. So let's get into it. So you want to interface with a social network, uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, whatever. Uh, well, there's a problem. Third-party interfaces are just inherently hard. Uh, a few reasons for this. One is that they're slow. Um, your database, your memcache, everything you're used to dealing with internally is fast, but as soon as you need to make an HTTP call out to another server, uh, it's god-awful slow. Users don't realize this, though. They want their data now. They can see their friends on Facebook right now. Why can't they see their friends on your site right now? My god, you're making my experience terrible. Just work already. Uh, also, third parties have uh, rate limits. Uh, the rules are different for every service. And Apple's not being nice to me right now. Go back. OK. Hey, arrow keys work. Uh, the rules are different for every service. Uh, you may not even know what the rate limits are. They may not be published. So you have to act uh, reactively as opposed to proactively to uh, make your system stable. Uh, third parties are also inherently unstable. There are outages. There are fail whales, all kinds of things that can mess you up. You have to be able to react to them. You have to be able to, uh, to uh, fix uh, when you get to some unknown internal state. Um, all these things make dealing with third parties a real pain. Uh, luckily, there is a great tool initially developed for Django, but uh, separated out from that, um, called Celery. Uh, and I highly recommend that you use it. Uh, this talk kind of assumes familiarity with it, so I hope you guys are already familiar with Celery. Otherwise, you might be a little bit lost. Uh, so why would we use Celery? A few reasons. It is asynchronous, so we don't have to do the work in the request response cycle. It is distributed, so we can throw as many resources uh, at it as we want and just have work done concurrently. Uh, it's also very fault tolerant. You can retry tasks. Um, you can uh, yeah, have nice failover support. So you've chosen to use Celery. And now you have uh, the proverbial two problems, which is actually a whole list of design problems that you have to overcome for uh, creating this d distributed system that acts uh, in a way that you expect it to. We'll go over the, uh, each of these in detail uh, throughout the talk. But before we dive in, I have a strong, a strong word of advice uh, on um, how you should be using Celery. Um, you should always use RabbitMQ as your broker. You should never use RabbitMQ as your results store. Uh, I, I understand that Celery supports multiple brokers, supports multiple results stores. Um, I, my opinion is very strong here. Uh, RabbitMQ is meant to be a message queue. It supports things like ACK that uh, keep you from losing work. Um, however, it makes a terrible result store because when you ask for the result the first time, Rabbit says, well, here you go. Here's the result. And now I'm going to forget about it forever and pretend like I don't know what the result is. So the second time you ask, which you often will ask more than once in a distributed system, uh, you are SOL as far as using Rabbit for your results store. Don't do it. So let's talk a bit about task organization. Ideally, you should make tasks as small and atomic as possible. Um, the idea here is that workers are ephemeral units. They can go away. You want to be able to scale up, scale down. You want to be able to quickly deploy code Making tasks small and atomic is the best way to do this. Smaller tasks also mean you get better distribution, better use of resources. Um, if you break up a single task into 100 tasks, now you can do those 100 bits concurrently, whereas you were bound uh, synchronously to do the 100 bits in series before. Uh, preferably, you should only have one third-party API call per task if you can structure it this way. This means that you get the most out of your rate limits. Uh, if you make API call one and two and then fail on three, and you have to redo the entire task over again, you have to make API call one and two over again, which is not just slow, but it eats into your resources uh, for those third-party interfaces. Uh, all this said, tasks are not free. 
You're actually serializing information, sending it up to uh, a message queue server, uh, pulling it back down from that server, deserializing it, and then doing the work. So for something as trivial as like a database write, uh, tasks are not a good idea. Um, you should make sure that the work is actually worth doing asynchronously. Another uh, good principle for task organization is to minimize the state that you pass in your messages. Uh, your task arguments should be uh, primitives when possible. Um, you should never pass model instances. I cannot state this strongly enough. Do not pass model instances as task arguments. Um, you are freezing the state once you serialize that object. Uh, when you deserialize it on the other end, you don't know how long it's been. You don't know what code has changed in between. Bad things can happen when you assume the state of your database as a model does, a model instance does, uh, throughout an unknown period of time. Uh, you should defer access uh, of data when possible to the task itself uh, in service of this minimization. And um, not only uh, does this prevent those sync, is sync issues I just talked about, um, but it also increases performance because you decrease the size of messages that go to the queue and back. Let's look at an example task of a bad way uh, to implement these things that I just talked about. So you have this uh, task here that takes a model instance as an argument, makes three API calls in series using that model, um, saves the, the model at the end. Um, that model save could fail. Uh, you could have a required field that's not serialized into the model, which uh, ran in a migration between when the model instance was serialized and deserialized. Uh, that's bad stuff. Uh, you could make all these uh, API calls uh, uh, concurrently if you use this task as a dispatcher, but because you're doing them in series, uh, you may uh, lose work, you may have to do work over again. It's a bad idea. So a better task organization is to uh, resolve the model instance from PK, uh, pass to the task as an argument, and then use the task as a dispatcher for as many API calls as you need to. Um, you see the dot delay call on each of those there. Uh, another interesting thing about um, actually resolving the model instance from within the task is that if you have tasks that are delayed from within a transaction, uh, that transaction may not be committed uh, by the time uh, the task gets worked by the worker, so that model instance may not actually be in your database. Having this check for accepting does not exist and retrying ensures the model instance is actually there and your database is in a known state. So another organization principle is that tasks are just classes. Even when you have a task function that you're decorating with a function decorator, it's actually making a task subclass and giving you back an instance of that class uh, as opposed to just you know, a regular decorated function. So um, take advantage of this and use the uh, class inheritance tools that are available to you when you need to share logic between uh, tasks. Uh, so you can create an abstract parent class. There's an actual abstract flag in the base uh, task class that you can set to true. And then you can wrap up common access patterns inside functions of your task subclasses. Uh, here's an example. So you have this task that takes a user ID, does some stuff, gets followers for Twitter. Um, most of this is boilerplate. Most of it can go away and be abstracted because you're making lots of different calls to Twitter, but you don't need to know how to access the access token every single time or instantiate a Twitter client. All this stuff can be done in an abstract parent class. So uh, you create this uh, subclass of tasks, set abstract to true, and you know, just give yourself a function, um, pass it args and quargs that you can pass through to the Twitter client. Uh, then all of this is nice and contained in your parent class. Your subclass then implements that and Almost all of the boilerplate is now gone. You could even put the user resolution into that API call function if you felt like it. That's just up to you. So another uh, organization principle is to, when possible, make tasks idempotent. Uh, I know this is not always possible, but it's really nice when you can do it because tasks will fail. Uh, they will just fail. There, there could be any number of reasons, but you have to plan for it. So the easiest way to correct from failure is to say, well, I'll just run that over again. You know, just, just do it again from the beginning. If your uh, tasks are idempotent, that is a trivial fix. If not, then you have to try to, uh, to uh, investigate where in the task it broke down, what your state is, and how you fix it. It's a much harder problem. So let's talk a little bit about task distribution. Uh, pagination, uh, when interfacing with third parties, is a very logical place to break up tasks into chunks. Um, and it's, uh, really, anything that you have inside of a for loop, you should be thinking, is there a small enough amount of state inside this for loop that I can break it up into its own task and execute them uh, in a concurrent way rather than having to loop through in series? 
so the strategies differ depending on what the third party accepts. Uh, some uh, accept a limit offset. Uh, Twitter has a cursor value that you actually get from a call to call for the next page, so you can't call one page until you've received the previous one. Uh, you don't always know the full set size that you're going for. Um, I believe that LinkedIn actually uh, kind of lies about the number of friends that you have in your network, so you can't really trust it. Um, so there are several pagination strategies you, you can employ. Um, so for the simplest case, where your limit offset is supported and you know your set size, then you make a single task dispatcher class, which dispatches concurrently every single page that you're going to scrape down uh, from your uh, network, you know, friends or whatever. So uh, you just you know, limit offset, you guys know how this works, you just dis uh, dispatch each and every task um, concurrently. That looks basically like this, really simple. Dispatcher, for loop, um, you have a range of limit offsets, you delay your tasks, they all launch immediately, everything works nice and fast. If you do not uh, have limit offset, uh, then your set size is irrelevant. You can't uh, launch the next page until you have the current one. This is the Twitter model, uh, the cursor way of doing things. So you have one page that um, kind of uh, recursively launches itself with the next cursor value and the next cursor value until you get the cursor value that says we're all done. That looks something like this. So uh, you don't have any dispatcher because you just start with a default cursor value. And then you keep calling pages uh, with the next cursor value until you get the magic one that says you're all done. Now let's say that you have limit offset support, but you don't know your set size. You could do what you did previously and just run them all, all your pages in series, but that wouldn't be taking good advantage of your concurrent resources. So instead, you can set a uh, size of concurrency for pages. Say we want to do three pages at a time uh, and launch each of those pages. Those pages then will leapfrog the ones uh, that are their brothers and sisters in the tree and launch the next one. So page one launches page four, page two, page five in this example. Uh, it is wasting a few API calls because if we were to do them in series, we would know at page six that there are no more friends left, and so we wouldn't have to launch page seven or eight. But uh, the benefit of the concurrency, I believe, outweighs the, some of the wasted API calls. So here's what that would look like. Uh, you have your dispatcher task, which uh, launches the first set of tasks. It sets the number of concurrent pages that will be run at the same time, and then it launches all of those um, concurrent pages. Uh, and then you have the concurrent or the uh, actual page itself, which sees after it makes the API call, do I have um, in this instance friends or do I have objects in this page? Uh, and if so, then it leapfrogs the one uh, the pages that are its brothers and sisters. Uh, you see next page num equals page num plus concurrent, and then you launch that page. Um, and so those are three basic pagination strategies. Uh, it is definitely an art, not a science. Uh, you will find that there are some services that allow you to have a large enough page size uh, that you can't actually call it with a maximum page size and keep your task times down to something reasonable because of the amount of processing you're having to do. Uh, when this happens, um, resist the temptation to pass around full API call results as state for messages. Uh, again, you're going to use up a lot of memory that way, use up a lot of resources. Um, it really is better to decrease your page size to something that you can reasonably handle, say, uh, I think we have like a minute uh, or something that we want to be able to run our tasks in. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you want to uh, avoid long-running tasks. And you can notify yourself when you are setting your page size too big by setting a timeout. Celery has a soft timeout feature. Uh, so you can say, you know, if a task goes over 60 seconds, kill it, and let me know that it's soft timed out. Um, and we'll get to that uh, a bit more later. So uh, when you're having these tasks, launching tasks, launching tasks, um, it's very hard to answer the question, am I done for this unit of work? In our case, we have users who are waiting on their network to be built, um, their social connections mapped to voter profiles. Uh, and so we have to be able to tell them, when are you done? Um, that requires that you're able to have a dependency graph of all of your tasks, um, bundle them all up together, and ask for the result state of every single task at the same time. Luckily, Celery 3 has this feature built in. We actually built it on Celery 2, but it works great um, baked into Celery 3. Go check out its dependency graph functions. Um, it'll actually raise an exception uh, if your graph isn't fully formed. Otherwise, you can use it as like a uh, result set. So you can ask for the re result of all the task IDs in your dependency graph together and get a single answer, which is extremely useful for users. 
Um, so this requires that you're actually using your result backend. Um, so make sure ignore result is set to false in your task subclasses. And for the love of God, do not use RabbitMQ as your result backend. Um, so I, I, I cannot emphasize that strongly enough. You will get confused and lost um, because Celery re uh, reports an unknown task state is pending. Uh, and the conflation between that and losing your uh, result state is very confusing. Uh, so let's talk a bit about rate limiting. Uh, first of all, Celery's rate limiting doesn't do at least what I thought it did when I started digging in. Probably doesn't do what you think it does either. Um, and second, uh, obviously, like we already said, third parties have all kinds of different rules for rate limiting, uh, published and unpublished, and so you need different strategies for tackling those rules. So let's look at a very simple example task. It doesn't do much, but it is incredibly important that this task only run at a rate of once per hour. Um, so let's see what Celery would do with this task. Uh, excuse me while I try to do a li live code demo. This could blow up. So um, let's uh, launch a worker daemon pool, just your standard old worker daemon pool. And in another window, launch a shell. Import our task and execute it. And you see in our uh, worker pool, it did log the warning just as we expected. Uh, everything's working so far. So let's try to launch another instance. OK, we launched another instance. It went through the queue. We did not see the warning message. So far, so good. Now at this point, let's say that we want to deploy some code. And so we want to take down our worker daemon pool, deploy some code, bring it back up. Uh, so let us do that with a warm shutdown, and then start the pool back up. And this will take a few seconds uh, for the act to go through and the task to be sent back to uh, RabbitMQ. But um, after a little while, we see that the task that had been rate limited before has now been run. Uh, so something is awry according to the way that we think rate limiting should work, or at least that I think rate limiting should work. Uh, so if, if you only have one worker pool, you're using Celery pretty lightly. So let's go ahead and launch another worker pool to uh, see what happens here. Let me delay a few more tasks. Uh, oh, so we see that other worker pool now has executed uh, another instance of that task. At this point, grandma has taken way too much insulin, and her life is in imminent danger. So let me go back to slideshow. All right, so what did we learn? We learned that rate limit built into Celery does not work with uh, cross multiple worker daemons. It fails on daemon restart. Um, but luckily, in our case, we're not actually enforcing the rate limits. We just want to respect rate limits externally imposed on us. So uh, we don't actually need to use Celery built-in rate limiting. Um, but I would encourage you, unless you have very specific needs, just not to use Celery's built-in rate limiting function because it doesn't actually do anything useful in a concurrent sense. Uh, rate limiting has many factors. It depends on who's asking sometimes, uh, what feature you're asking for in the API, uh, whether the information you're requesting is public or private, and a whole bunch of other unknown things that you'll run into when you run into them, and they will surprise you. Uh, let's just take an example here from Twitter. Uh, Twitter is nice enough to give you rate limiting information in the HTTP headers of every single API call you make. Uh, the top uh, request is simply to account settings. You see that there's a rate limit remaining, a timestamp for when you get more calls, and a rate limit class. That class is actually different for the search function of the Twitter API, uh, and it's actually based on the feature. So you see this X feature limit class and limit remaining reset. They're all independent of your other rate limits. So you see that um, you have to handle rate limits um, based on uh, many different conditions. Uh, so when I show you uh, generate key functions and the sam code samples to come, um, you have to think to yourself, OK, I'm going to be generating a key based on the access token, based on the uh, URL path, that sort of thing, uh, in order to enforce these rate limits. So let's uh, tackle the simplest solution first. Let's say you know your limits and you have a fixed time window. This is the Twitter uh, instance. Um, Twitter has a Unix timestamp to say, this is when you get more requests. This is how many you get until then. Uh, the simplest way is to just keep making requests willy-nilly until you get rate limited, uh, then pull the timestamp out of, uh, uh, of the headers and see when you get more requests, and delay your tasks until then, and then just open the floodgates again uh, until you get rate limited again. 
Uh, it's harder if you need to be able to say to your user, uh, this is how many calls you have left this hour, and this is when you'll get more calls, but we're not going to tackle that situation right now. So uh, a code example of this known limits problem is, uh, again, this generate key function I said. You, you see if it exists. Uh, I'm using Redis as a you know, persistence uh, layer here. Um, you get a, a timestamp out of that Redis key if it exists. You figure out how far it is into the future in seconds, and you set your countdown on a retry to that value so that you don't try again until you have your new set of uh, calls. Um, if you don't get rate limited, then you try to make the call. If you then get rate limited, then you set that Redis key to the timestamp of when I get more calls left, and you retry with pretty much the same countdown. You're going to see this pattern throughout all these rate limiting examples where you try to make the call. Uh, you get rate limited, and then you do this exact same strategy that you would do had you been rate limited before you tried to make the call in the first place. So let's say that you have known rate limits, but with a rolling time window, say like 25 calls per 48 hours. Uh, in this case, uh, the solution is a bit more complex. The way I like to solve it is with a Redis sorted set of timestamps, uh, so that then you can say, OK, right now the beginning of my window is 48 hours ago. So any timestamps that are older than that, just chop them off the list. Then look at the size of the list. And is it smaller than my uh, total rate limit size? If yes, then I'm free to make a call. If no, then I need to wait until the oldest one would have fallen off the list before I try to make a call again. Uh, an example of doing this, uh, it's exactly what I said. Uh, ZREM range by score is a nice Redis function to say uh, anything in this range of values just knock off. And then Z card just gives you the size of the sorted set. If it's below your rate limit, then you're free to make the call and add your timestamp to the sorted set. Otherwise, you see when the first one would fall off the expiration window, and you wait for that number of seconds. So let's say that you don't know your rate limit at all, uh, as is the case most of the time with Facebook. Uh, you just need to react when you do get rate limited. So in this case, uh, we use a strategy called exponential back off. Uh, which means you have a counter that's stored that serves as your exponent for the amount of time you wait. Uh, you simply close the floodgates tighter and tighter uh, until you hit some maximum ceiling of the maximum time you're willing to wait before you make the call again. Uh, so what that looks like in code, uh, you have this uh, exponent that is stored as a counter in Redis. Um, if the exponent is there, before even trying to make the call, you um, count, uh, retry with a countdown of two to the back off exponent seconds. Uh, otherwise, you try to make the call. If you get rate limited, you do the same thing. You increment the key in Redis, and you set a uh, countdown on your retry with, again, two to the back of exponent seconds. Um, this same strategy employed of, am I rate limited? No, try to make the call. Oh, I got rate limited. Employ the same uh, scenario. So let's talk about failover for a little bit. Um, there are problems, uh, in, in my opinion, with Seller's implementation of Countdown. Uh, it doesn't do either what I thought it did when I first looked at the feature. And as we've already talked about, third parties can fail in lots of really interesting ways. So let's talk about Countdown a bit. Um, I would like to show you a code demo, but I don't have time to do this one. Uh, so you're just going to have to take my word for it that when you retry a task with a countdown, what it does is it goes through the queue uh, along with an ETA that is serialized into that queue message. Um, that gets immediately dispatched to a worker. The ETA gets uh, deserialized by the worker, and it says, oh, I'm not supposed to work this task right now. Uh, I will hold on to it uh, and work other tasks until the ETA is passed. And then you have a worker internally prioritizing tasks that it can grab from a queue versus tasks that it can work uh, that have been held in this countdown sort of uh, in-between state. Um, you would think that you would lose work this way if you lost your worker daemon because the task is being stored in the worker daemon. It's been consumed from the queue. Luckily, RabbitMQ has an ACK feature that keeps this from happening. It will happen in other uh, brokers, which is one reason why I say only use RabbitMQ as your broker. Um, but it is still highly suboptimal because now you, you've taken this nice centralized queue that you can distribute your resources exactly how you want to, and you've deferred that decision of priority down to the worker. Uh, and this is not something that I want to do. So uh, instead, I implement an extension of the AMQP um, protocol um, called dead letter exchange. Uh, now, I've got a nice graph to show what this is. If you're not familiar with AMQP, I'll explain the components of you. So AMQP has exchanges that message to go into. Um, queues then bind to these exchanges using routing keys. Uh, and the exchange uh, 
uh, when it gets a message, it says, okay, what queues do I have bound to me with routing keys that make sense for this message? I'll dispatch that message to all of these queues, and then you have consumers that pull a message off the queue and, uh, and actually do something with that message. In this case, those consumers are celery workers. What we do with a dead letter exchange is we set a TTL on the queue for um, message expiration. So we'll say, OK, any message that goes in this queue should expire 60 seconds after it gets to the queue if it hasn't been consumed by a consumer yet. And the dead letter exchange property says, once that expiration happens, then transfer the message over to another exchange and treat it as if it had just reached that exchange fresh. Uh, so what happens here is we create this temporary queue just for our message that we want to have a countdown on. We set the TTL equal to the countdown value uh, that we want to use and set a dead letter exchange of our normal celery exchange. We uh, hook no workers up to this temporary queue, so it has no choice but for the message to expire in the queue. Uh, it gets transferred to the other regular celery exchange at which point it gets treated like a regular message would had you, you know, sent the task there in the first place. Uh, so uh, a bit of code from a subclass uh, implementation of apply async um, actually shows you how you would set up this temporary queue and change the routing options. So we uh, go ahead and generate a task ID because it's useful to use that as the queue name because we know it's unique. Um, we have this uh, countdown exchange that we've defined in our settings that says this is the exchange to use for countdown. You know, set at all of your temporary queues here. We set the TTL and dead letter exchange. We also set an X expires header on this queue so that the queue will take care of itself uh, after the temporary message that we put into it has dead letter exchanged over to the seller exchange. So we don't have a bunch of empty queues sitting around. Uh, then we change the routing options uh, for this task that's about to be sent up to, to Rabbit um, to the new queue we've created with the exchange that we have defined in our settings and everything just works. Uh, it, it actually works pretty darn well, although it requires that you use RabbitMQ as your broker because it is all AMQP specific. Um, so again, uh, third parties can fail in lots of interesting ways, and the best defense against this is to wrap up all of your interesting solutions into a single uh, function in a task parent class that you use for um, is segmented by like social network or by third party. Uh, so you'll have your base Twitter task class that has all of the weird edge cases and oh what fail whales here and you know it does this thing here where you'll have uh, an item and a list of friends. It doesn't actually exist anymore and so you have to go double check that it's there somewhere else and all of these weird edge cases you're going to run into. You wrap them all up into a single function and then you call that function from all of your uh, child classes so that all of your you know, crazy edge case logic is wrapped up in one place. Uh, so now let's talk about having multiple queues. Uh, first of all, why would you want to use multiple queues in Celery? Well, uh, prioritization is pretty coarse-grained um, in all of these message queues, so the best way to priori prioritize tasks for real is to segment them into separate queues. You also then have control over the resources that you give to each queue, because in the uh, Celery worker daemon pool, you can send it a flag that tells it what queues these workers should be pulling from. Um, this uh, allows you to do lots of cool things like have uh, resources available to handle big spikes for large users or to do low uh, priority management, you know, kind of maintenance tasks that you want to do in what I call a trickle queue. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, it's really easy to set up multiple queues in Celery. It's just a setting. You uh, say, I want a queue named this. Uh, the routing key called binding key here is that. And then uh, when you launch your worker daemon pools, you say, OK, here are the queues that these workers are going to consume from. So going back to the idea of a trickle queue, let's say that you have 100,000 users, and you're pulling all their avatars from, uh, from Twitter uh, internally. But uh, you want to keep them up to date, um, but you want to do this in a maintainable way. Uh, so it would be a very bad thing to dump 100,000 tasks in a cron you know, into a queue all at once and say, OK, now you chew through 100,000 tasks. Because you may have other maintenance tasks that are going on at the same time, and you're going to starve resources from your other tasks. So you have uh, a cron run that kind of trickles tasks into these low priority queues, say, uh, oh, I want to work the next uh, 50 Twitter users, update their avatars, and do that every five minutes or so. Uh, so you set up a queue specifically for that kind of work, uh, and you have it you know, fire off from a cron, store a cursor somewhere, a file, a database record, whatever, to say, here's where I left off at le uh, last. Now let's take like the next 50 users and keep on going. 
Um, so the reason, uh, well, I've, I've mentioned that uh, you do all this using a cron, but those of you who are familiar with Celery will say, well, why don't you just make it a periodic task? Celery supports that. To which I say, uh, Celery Beat, don't use it. Um, there may be a, a use case where Celery Beat beats out cron, but I have not found it yet. Um, so uh, a few of the whys, I recommend this. Um, First of all, uh, the periodic task persistence layer that Celery uses gets out of sync with code when you delete periodic tasks. You have to go manually delete the database record or the file uh, row or whatever to tell uh, Celery that, uh, oh, this periodic task isn't there anymore. So you shouldn't be trying to send it over to workers. Otherwise, you'll get a bunch of exceptions from workers saying, uh, what is this task? I don't know about this task because they have the new code, but the uh, persistence layer of periodic task doesn't know about it. Uh, it's just one more process to manage. It's one more thing that could go, could go down, one more thing that could go wrong. Uh, if any of you would like to tell me when the last time was that cron failed for you, I would be very interested to hear it. Uh, and also, cron is just not that hard. Um, I really don't see a reason to use this reinvention of the cron wheel. Uh, so I have a few more minutes for some extras. Uh, I'm surprised I made it this far. I must be talking fast. Um, so uh, when you're debugging uh, on your local machine, I really, really strongly recommend that you turn always eager false. You set up your own RabbitMQ server. You set up your own worker pools. Uh, this will save you lots of headaches. It's closer to production, which is just good for debugging in general. Uh, and um, yeah, you, you won't be hung up like, say, uh, say you do something on your site that launches 100 tasks that take 10 minutes to run or whatever. Um, you're going to be waiting for that web page for 10 minutes if you have always eager true, uh, and you're going to be very frustrated, especially if you're our lead designer who doesn't understand why he has to wait for 10 minutes to get his, to his profile. Um, so uh, yeah, develop with always eager false, set up your environment as you would production. Uh, now, you, it's really a lot harder to set breakpoints in your code, so you have to rely more on logging for debugging. I think this is actually a good thing because, again, it's what you're going to have to do in production. It will force you, when you're writing code, to also write good logging. Um, logging is incredibly important in any sort of distributed system to know what the heck is going on at any given point in time. Uh, and third, when you're dealing with third parties, unit tests are good, but you really should have a suite of integration tests as well. Um, there's this idea that you shouldn't mock anything that you don't control the API of, but um, if you're dealing with third parties, you're almost certainly mocking out those calls to those APIs because you don't actually want to be calling Twitter and Facebook and all these guys in your test suite. Uh, that's okay, except that you've now made assumptions about the interface that you're calling out to that uh, you, you can't make good on. Uh, you don't know that Twitter hasn't changed or Facebook hasn't changed just from running your test suite. You have to have an integration suite to double check that the interface that you're relying on in your mocks actually still exists. Uh, a few gotchas uh, with Celery. This is, first one is just a very basic Python thing. It's all of Python. Um, C-level blocking will prevent uh, anything else from coming in and saying, hey, hey, I want to raise an exception. So uh, this soft timeout that Celery nicely provides to you means nothing if you have a socket that's open for 10 minutes because you didn't bother to set a timeout on it. Uh, if you are using a client library that doesn't support setting a socket timeout, maybe you should consider using a different client library because uh, setting socket timeouts on these third-party calls is extremely important. Uh, another one is that even though it, uh, Celery does give you this soft timeout, it doesn't automatically retry the task when the exception is raised. So you need to be catching that exception somewhere for tasks that you want to be able to retry once the task is gone too long. It's very likely that Facebook was just slow that time. It'll be fast the next time. So if you want to retry it, make sure that that soft timeout is caught and you're actually retrying. Uh, I already mentioned this last one, but uh, if Celery doesn't know what your task result state is, it will tell you it's pending. Um, this doesn't matter if the Redis key doesn't exist. Uh, it doesn't matter if you used RabbitMQ as your result store, which I told you not to, and it went away after the first call. Rabbit will tell you pending, 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 and you won't know what that means because it actually means I have no idea. So just be aware of that when you are looking at result states of your tasks, that pending doesn't mean pending. Pending means I don't know. Uh, so now, uh, I guess, time for questions. So when you're talking about how we shouldn't use Celery Beat, 
What's sort of the concrete way you'd fire off tasks at, say, 6 a.m. every day with CronTab? Would you run them through a managed command, or? I'm having trouble hearing. Sorry. Uh, if we want to fire off tasks, let's say, at certain, you know, 9 o'clock every day, without Stellar being with CronTab, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. would you fire them off through a management command, or? Management command, shell scripts, whatever. I mean, um, uh, it's, it's Python. We all know how to use Python. However you want to interface that with the shell is up to you. Um, but. Uh, yeah, it would be very easy to create a management command shim to just say run the task with the name that I specify on the command line. Um, so apologies if I misunderstood the advice, but if you're turning off always eager and you want to test that result, or let's say either you want to test the result or you want to ignore the result because it's not relevant, why would you even queue it? Or what would you do in your test to, to check if it's going to be happening asynchronously in your unit test? So you're talking about using uh, always eager false in combination with your unit tests? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That uh, that's a very hard problem. It's one I actually haven't. Uh, I don't have a good solution to. Okay. Uh, we actually run our test suite with always eager true. Um, that's something we would like to not do. Uh, but the only thing that I can think to try is to you know um, uh, time sleep in a loop until the the task has been done and then continue. Mm -hmm. There's no real good solution to distributed testing that I know of. But I would be ecstatic to hear if somebody has solved that problem. Cool. So Thanks. good question. Any more? All right. Thanks. Thank you, David. Thank you.